Greetings, my name is Larry Stack. I'm an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine and Pediatrics at Vanderbilt University. Interpretation of the head CT scan is a skill emergency and primary care physicians must master to provide excellent care for their patients. Accurately identifying and describing head CT findings to colleagues of all specialties will enhance patient care. The five-step approach used in this tutorial was developed by Dr. Eric Gregory, a neurosurgeon from Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio, Texas, and refined by Dr. David Manthe, an emergency medicine colleague from Wake Forest University. It is a simple, easy-to-remember method to accurately interpret a head CT scan. At the end of this tutorial, participants should be able to use this five-step approach to accurately and confidently interpret a head CT scan. And secondly, they will be able to accurately communicate head CT findings to a medical colleague. The five-step approach begins with ensuring the study is adequate for interpretation. The bone windows are then evaluated for fractures and soft tissue swelling. Three ventricles are then carefully inspected for effacement and symmetry. The quadrigeminal cistern is a critical structure for identifying abnormality because of its proximity to the tentorium and circle of Willis. Finally, the brain parenchyma must be evaluated for disease or injury. Step one is to ensure the adequacy of the study. You must ask yourself, are you looking at the correct scan of your patient? Be extremely careful to make decisions on the correct patient information, especially in patients transferred from outside facilities. In adults, the slice thickness should be no greater than five millimeters below the tentorium and no greater than 10 millimeters above the tentorium. In children, the slice thickness should be no greater than five millimeters above and below the tentorium. Slices that are too thick may result in bone averaging artifact or may miss a lesion smaller than the slice thickness. Slice thickness is typically noted on each CT image. Contrast does not cross the normal blood-brain barrier, but does accumulate in vessels, the meninges, which do not have a blood-brain barrier, in areas where the blood-brain barrier is disrupted. The circle of Willis and peel vessels on the surface of the brain will appear enhanced or white. The normal falx and tentorium will also show contrast enhancement or appear white. The type and amount of contrast is typically indicated on each CT image. A normal contrast enhanced CT may be difficult to differentiate from an acute subarachnoid hemorrhage. Emergency and primary care physicians infrequently order contrasted head CT scans. Suspicion of a cerebral abscess or mass are the most frequent reasons to order a contrast enhanced head CT scan. Examining the symmetry of the ventricles and parenchyma is a critical step in the evaluation of these structures for abnormality. If the patient's head is tilted left or right while being scanned, these structures will appear asymmetric and be more difficult to interpret. The best guide to determine if a patient is square in the scanner is to look at the slice with the ocular lenses. The ocular lenses are approximately 10 millimeters in size and should be seen symmetrically in the same slice if the patient is square in the scanner. The patient shown here seems to be square in the scanner. Motion artifact significantly lessens the useful information gained from a slice, and if present, is best to be rescanned. These lines diagonally across the scan demonstrate motion artifact. The correct number of cuts or slices is determined by the correct starting and ending points and the slice thickness. The inferior starting point is at the level of the foramen magnum. The most superior cut should be only bone with no parenchyma. This ensures the apex of the parenchyma has been studied. An apical subdural hematoma is infrequently seen but must be considered when evaluating a head CT for traumatic brain injury. Step two is to evaluate the bone windows. This is especially important for trauma patients. First, look for soft tissue swelling. Soft tissue swelling seen on bone windows should prompt the reader to look for underlying skull fracture or parenchymal injury such as cerebral contusion, subdural or epidural blood on corresponding cuts of the parenchymal windows. The reader should also look at the contracu parenchyma for contusion. Lacerations, like soft tissue swelling, should prompt the reader to look for bone injury and brain injury in corresponding slices on the parenchymal windows. Skull fractures are described as linear, basilar, depressed, diastatic, ballistic, open, or comminuted. Again, the corresponding parenchymal windows should be carefully evaluated for hematoma, coup, and contracu injuries. Pneumocephalus may be seen in patients with lacerations overlying a skull fracture or fractures involving the inner table of the frontal sinus. Pneumocephalus is best seen on bone windows. Air collections, such as sinus air or intracranial air, are best seen on the bone windows. Mucosal thickening and an air fluid level are seen in the right maxillary sinus. The bone windows offer an excellent look at paranasal sinuses and mastoid air cells. A lateral skull film is used as a scout to align the scanner gantry and orient the CT slices. Certain skull fractures, foreign bodies, and post-surgical defects may be seen on the scout film 
Don't overlook this image as a source of useful information. Step three in the evaluation of the head CT scan is to examine the ventricles, which are cerebral spinal fluid spaces. Size, shape, symmetry, spatial relationship, and the presence of blood are features which require examination. Ventricular size may be enlarged diffusely, or focally, as compared to the normal-sized ventricles seen here. Increased size is either due to loss of brain tissue from atrophy or encephalomalacia, or from increased amounts of cerebral spinal fluid from hydrocephalus. The encephalomalacia demonstrated by the arrow is due to a previous stroke. Atrophy may be differentiated from hydrocephalus by enlargement of the gyri and sulci in addition to enlarged ventricles as seen in the scan on the right. Ventricular size may be decreased due to mass effect from some version of cerebral pathology. An epidural hematoma is severely displacing the parenchyma causing effacement of the posterior horn of the left lateral ventricle as shown by the arrow. Ventricular shape may be distorted by mass effect, edema, or increased intracranial pressure. A cerebral mass, as shown by the white arrow, has changed the normal shape of the anterior horn of the right lateral ventricle, as shown by the yellow arrow, and the posterior horn of the right lateral ventricle, as shown by the blue arrow. Asymmetric ventricles may be a clue to a mass or edema. The reader must also recognize if the patient's head is not square in the CT scanner. This patient has asymmetric posterior horns of the lateral ventricles, as shown by the blue arrows. The third ventricle is also compressed, or effaced, as it should be seen in the same cut as the pineal gland, shown here by the yellow arrow. These effects are due to a large subdural hematoma seen on more superior slices. The ventricles should be in correct spatial relationship to the brain's midline. This epidural hematoma, identified by the white arrow, distorts the correct spatial relationship of the anterior and posterior horns, identified by the yellow arrows, which are pushed across the brain's midline. The anterior and posterior horns are nearly completely effaced by the mass effect of the expanding hematoma. Blood in the posterior horn of the right lateral ventricle forms a meniscus, as shown by the blue arrow. Do not confuse blood with the choroid plexus, which is identified by the yellow arrow. Cerebral spinal fluid spaces above the tentorium include the paired lateral ventricles, which include the frontal horns, occipital horns, and temporal horns. The midline third ventricle is also above the tentorium. The fourth ventricle is located within the posterior fossa. When scrolling through the cuts from superior to inferior, the body of the lateral ventricles will typically be the first cerebral spinal fluid spaces that you see. The body of the lateral ventricles are outlined here in yellow. As you continue to scroll from superior to inferior, one will then see the occipital horns of the lateral ventricles, also called the posterior horns. They are outlined here in yellow. As you continue to scroll down from superior to inferior, you will then encounter the frontal horns of the lateral ventricles, which are also called the anterior horns. They are shaped like backward parentheses and are outlined here in purple. As you continue to scroll inferiorly, the temporal horns, or temporal tips, of the lateral ventricles are seen at or near the level of the quadrigeminal cistern. These are typically L-shaped structures and may not be seen, especially in older generation scanners. The temporal horns are sensitive for the detection of hydrocephalus. If they are prominent, consider hydrocephalus as a diagnosis. The size of the temporal horns on the right CT, as indicated by the yellow arrows, are normal in size. The temporal horns on the left CT, as indicated by the blue arrows, are enlarged from developing hydrocephalus. The third ventricle is a single, midline, slit-like structure that is located at the level of the pineal gland. 
The pineal gland is typically calcified in adults. The pineal gland, identified by the arrow, doesn't usually become calcified until after the age of six years. It has no blood-brain barrier and will appear enhanced with contrast. The third ventricle sits just anterior to the pineal gland and is seen here in yellow. The third ventricle makes an exclamation point with the calcified pineal gland. The facement of the third ventricle is a sensitive finding for early mass effect due to extraaxial bleeding, tumor, mass, or edema. The pineal gland, indicated by the yellow arrow, is typically just posterior to the third ventricle. The blue area points to the location where the third ventricle should be seen. It is effaced on this CT scan. The fourth ventricle is located below the tentorium in the posterior fossa. It is typically oval shaped, or maybe shaped like a pith helmet, as seen here in yellow. Blood in the fourth ventricle is rarely seen, but is shown here by the arrow. Compression or effacement of the fourth ventricle occurs infrequently, but is seen here as a result of severe trauma. In review, the fourth ventricle is below the level of the tentorium, located in the posterior fossa, and is oval shaped in this patient, and is outlined here in yellow. Step four in this process is the evaluation of the quadrigeminal cistern, which is located at the level of the tentorium. It is shaped like a baby's bottom when the legs are held up as though the diaper is being changed and is shown here in yellow. If the quadrigeminal cistern is effaced from mass effect or edema, a herniation syndrome is present. In this scan, the quadrigeminal cistern, indicated by the yellow arrows, is completely effaced and appears to contain blood. The quadrigeminal cistern is adjacent to the cervicovillus. Blood found in the quadrigeminal cistern, as demonstrated by the arrows, in a patient with sudden onset of headache, suggests rupture of a saccular aneurysm of the circle of Willis. In this patient with a rupture of a saccular aneurysm, blood is also seen in the sylvian fissures, shown by the blue arrows, and in the basilar cistern, as shown by the yellow arrow. To locate the quadrigeminal cistern, we first identify the dorsal aspect of the cella tersica, also called the dorsum cella. The quadrigeminal cistern is typically located within two cuts superior to the dorsum cella. Step five in the evaluation of the head CT scan is the examination of the brain parenchyma. These features include midline shift, symmetry, blood, edema, ischemia, and tumor. Midline shift is the first feature of the brain parenchyma to evaluate. Look at the five midline structures to determine if midline shift is present. Midline shift may occur from tumor, generalized edema, or bleeding. The first midline structure to look at is the fourth ventricle. The fourth ventricle is infrequently displaced from the midline, but is displaced in this scan by the acute posterior fossa hematoma, shown by the arrow. The third ventricle is also a midline structure. The third ventricle is displaced from midline by a large left side mass and surrounding edema in this patient. The septum pellucidum is also a midline structure. The septum pellucidum is displaced from midline in this scan by a large left side mass with edema. The falx cerebri is also a midline structure used to evaluate for midline shift. The term falx will be used interchangeably with falx cerebri. The falx is markedly displaced from midline by a large epidural hematoma in this patient. The pineal gland is also a midline structure used to evaluate for midline shift. The pineal appears to be shifted right from midline by a large epidural hematoma. Drawing a line through the center of the brain may help to detect the presence of midline shift. Start the line at the frontal crest and end at the internal occipital crest. Measure the distance from the midline to the displaced structures. Symmetry is defined as the correspondence in size, form, and arrangement of parts on opposite sides of a plane. Normal cerebral hemispheres should be fairly symmetric. Asymmetry suggests pathology is present or the patient may have their head tilted in the scanner. Blood in the head can be extraaxial, which means it does not accumulate within but outside of the brain parenchyma, or intraparenchymal, meaning the blood accumulates within the brain tissue itself. Extraaxial blood includes subdural bleeding, as seen here, and epidural bleeding, as seen here. Subarachnoid blood is also extraaxial and can be traumatic or aneurysmal in origin. 
traumatic subarachnoid blood is seen in this scan. Blood can also be intraparenchymal, which includes contusions, sheer hemorrhage, bleeding from hypertension, tumor, infarction, or coagulopathy. Subdural hematomas are typically due to injury to the bridging veins. They will cross suture lines, unlike epidural hematomas, and they won't cross the midline except in the posterior fossa. When following the convexity of the skull, they are crescent-shaped and may occur spontaneously, especially in elderly patients or patients on warfarin or clopidogrel. Subdural hematomas can be acute, subacute, and chronic, and the CT appearance or density of the hematoma suggests the age of the bleed. An acute subdural hematoma, as seen here, is radiographically hyperdense or white. It may be just hours old. A subacute subdural hematoma is approximately 5 to 7 days in age. It appears isodense to the brain. The subdural hematoma seen in this patient is not uniform, as there are some areas that appear hypodense as well as isodense relative to the brain. Chronic subdural hematomas are approximately 11 to 13 days old and appear hypodense or black as seen here. Hyperacute bleeding, also called active extravasation, appears hypodense as seen here by the arrow. The reason it is hypodense is that the blood is not yet clotted. Subdural blood can also collect along the tentorium as seen here. Subdural blood can accumulate along the falx as shown here. The falx is a thin layer of dura that lies in the interhemispheric fissure. A subdural hematoma along the falx will appear as a hyperdense structure that is frequently asymmetric. Epidural hematomas are typically arterial in origin and most commonly occur from an injury to the middle meningeal artery and its branches. Epidural hematomas are frequently accompanied by a skull fracture as seen here. They are biconvex or lens-shaped as seen here and may cross the midline, but obviously not in this case, but do not cross suture lines. Differentiating between an epidural and subdural hematoma is sometimes difficult, however, it is not that important. Recognizing that the blood is extraaxial versus intraparenchymal is more important. Thickness of the bleed is an important factor for the determination of the need for operative management. If an acute bleed is 5 mm or greater in children, or 10 mm or greater in adults, surgical evacuation is strongly considered. Cerebral contusions are ill-defined areas of petechial hemorrhage that involves the superficial cortex. The white matter underlying the cortex is usually spared. Cerebral contusions are frequently contracoup lesions as seen in this patient who fell and struck his occiput. Temporal lobe contusions, because of their proximity to the tentorium, can cause herniation if they expand. Traumatic axonal injury, formerly called shear injury, occurs from severe rotational acceleration and deceleration forces to the brain. Traumatic axonal injury is usually seen at the gray-white matter interface as seen here. Traumatic axonal injuries are most commonly seen in the frontal and temporal lobes. Hemorrhagic traumatic axonal injuries appear as collections of acute blood a few millimeters to several centimeters in size. 25% of axonal injuries are hemorrhagic. Non-hemorrhagic axonal injuries may be difficult to see on CT scan and are better visualized on MRI. Intraparenchymal hemorrhage may be due to hypertension, illicit drug use, anticoagulant use, coagulopathy, or vascular malformation. The most common cause is hypertension. Hypertensive hemorrhages are due to rupture of deep perforating vessels and will manifest as bleeding in the area of the basal ganglia as pointed out by the arrow. Traumatic subarachnoid blood results from injury to the leptomeningeal vessels and bleeding into the space beneath the subarachnoid membrane. Traumatic subarachnoid blood is typically found on the convexities next to the skull. Blood interdigitates into the cortical sulci conforming to the subarachnoid space as seen in this patient. Traumatic subarachnoid bleeding is frequently seen with traumatic epidural and subdural hematomas. Trauma is the most common cause of bleeding into the subarachnoid space. In contrast, aneurysmal subarachnoid blood is typically found in the quadrigeminal cistern as shown by the solid arrows here, and the basilar cisterns as shown by the yellow arrow, and the sylvian fissures as shown by the blue arrows. It is most commonly due to the rupture of a saccular aneurysm of the circle of Willis. It is important to distinguish between a traumatic and aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage as the evaluation and management of the latter is much more extensive. Cerebral edema can be generalized as seen on the right or focal as seen on the left. There are two types of localized cerebral edema, cytotoxic and vasogenic. Cytotoxic edema occurs within minutes of the onset of ischemia and cellular functions are disrupted, resulting in cellular edema. Cytotoxic edema is difficult to see on CT scan. Vasogenic cerebral edema appears as an ill-defined hypodensity of the white matter and spares the gray matter. Vasogenic edema is due to a disruption of the blood-brain barrier 
and is seen surrounding tumors, infections, and in the late stages of cerebral infarction. Vasogenic edema seen in this patient is due to a large occipital tumor. Diffuse or global cerebral edema is identified by extensive and bilateral loss of gray-white matter differentiation. Diffuse sulcal effacement, which is shown here on the left hemisphere, and defacement of the basilar cisterns, which includes the quadrigeminal cistern, and is demonstrated by the arrows. Ischemic stroke is apparent on non-contrasted head CT scan in only 20-30% to 30 of patients, and the earliest findings may be seen at 6-12 to 12 hours. Head CT scan is done predominantly to exclude hemorrhagic stroke or other causes of a patient's symptoms. MRI may detect ischemic stroke findings as early as 2 hours after symptom onset. The head CT scan see here 48 hours after symptom onset reveals edema manifest by the hypodense area in the right hemisphere with midline shift. A hyperdense appearing cerebral artery on CT scan is indicative of occlusion due to thrombus formation. The area it supplies is at risk for ischemia. Occlusion of the internal carotid artery and middle cerebral artery have more adverse consequences due to the large cerebral mass these arteries supply. The insula is an area of cerebral cortex located between the sylvian fissure, shown here with the yellow arrow, and the putamen, shown here with the blue arrow, that is supplied by perforating branches of the middle cerebral artery and is susceptible to ischemia. The yellow area is the insula. A normal insula is shown here by the yellow arrow. Loss of this insular ribbon, or stripe, is a subtle indication of early middle cerebral artery stroke and is shown here by the blue arrow. The more metabolically active gray matter becomes hypodense due to edema from ischemia and the white ribbon becomes homogeneous to the subcortical white matter. Cytotoxic edema occurs from intracellular accumulation of fluid from ischemia. White and gray matter are involved and loss of gray-white differentiation is seen. The encircled area is an example. Edema occurs in the distribution of the vessel involved. Compression of the cerebral spinal fluid spaces and asymmetry of the cortical sulci suggest marked brain swelling and mass effect. This is typically seen beyond the first 24 hours of ischemic symptoms. In this patient whose CT scan is obtained 72 hours after the onset of ischemic symptoms, demonstrates effacement of the lateral ventricles and midline shift as shown by the displacement of the septum pellucidum toward the left as shown by the arrow. On non-contrasted CT scan, tumors appear as ill-defined, low-density areas which represent vasogenic edema and tumor mass. Vasogenic edema, identified by the arrow, is low density in appearance. The tumor mass is likely in the area of the yellow oval. Contrast is required to better delineate the mass. However, MRI is superior to CT to localize and identify tumors. This concludes this educational activity. I trust this activity will benefit you and your patients. Thank you for your attention.